My name is Bruce LaBruce. I'm a filmmaker from Toronto, Canada. I have two films in the Berlin Alley this year, Ulrika's Brain, which is in Forum Expanded, and The Misandrous in the Panorama section. Frau Pfeiffer, stimmt das Gerücht, dass Sie im Besitz des Gehirns von Ulrike Meinhoff sind, der berühmten RAF-Terroristin? Wir können keinen Kommentar dazu abgeben. Sie können sowieso keinen Kommentar abgeben. Ja. Miss Pfeiffer, Miss Pfeiffer, what will you do with Ulrike Meinhoffs Brain tonight? Aus Asche, aus dem Feuer bist du geboren worden. Unser Volk, das Reich zu neuem Glanze zurückzuführen und zu befreien von den amerikanischen jüdischen Schwein. Can you all repeat that? Parthenogenesis. And remember girls, the closest way to a man's heart is through his chest. Make love fearlessly and femininely in the name of freedom for female people. Freedom for female people! Welcome, Bruce LaBruce. Nice to have you here. Thank you. At this year's Berlinale International Film Festival, you will show two films of yours. The Misandrist is one of them, and the other is Ulrike's Brain. Yes. It must have been a quite productive year, last year, for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I have a bunch of films in development that have bigger budgets, but rather than wait forever to like you know make a film uh financing takes forever i decided to make this lower budget film so i wrote it last january um of the misandrus mm -hmm. and shot it in the spring and posted it in the fall and now here we are at the berlinelli so the other one Ulrika's brain has been in is sort of been on the back burner for a long time because it's, it's based on a performance i did at camp nagel in in uh, hamburg about four or five years ago And then I saw it. It was like a performance installation at a uh, at a uh, exhibition called uh, Die und Toten. And, um, What was it called? Sorry. Die und Toten. Ah, Die und Toten. Die und okay. Toten. Yeah. And it was all about the ideas of the posthuman and like the new definitions of life and death. So I came up with this idea of Ulrika's brain, Ulrika Manov's brain being, uh, you know, it disappeared famously with the other brains of the of the. RAF and um, so a doctor in my story ha has the brain and she's trying to uh, bring it transplant the brain into a, a female body to start a new feminist revolution so um, th that's a, kind of like the genesis of the misandrist too because I did this this performance installation over a three-day conference and then shot additional material in Hamburg subsequently to make it into a film but the idea for making a a film about a feminist revolution really came from this core idea of Ulrika's brain. I see. And actually Ulrika's brain appears at, shortly as a film within the film in the Misandras. So they're actually really uh, connected. I, s I mean, you go into the cinema within your film, so I mean the uh, Liberation Army, the female Liberation Army goes into the screening room, but this is like you have like in the in the Ulrika's brain it's the same situation so you're going into the cinema so this is quite important to you to spread the message right the cinema as a place of like uh, 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 to spread uh, uh, like uh, 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 insurrection yeah. yeah absolutely yeah no I mean you know I think cinema especially today should be uh, you know uh, insurrection more, more than ever so and this idea of actually bringing it into the into the actual movie theater as a kind of meta uh, narrative is, um, you know, it's about uh, theory versus praxis. It's like bringing um, the kind of theoretical revolution that I talk about in the films uh, right into the cinema, uh, literally, you know. So. so you spoke about like budgets. Both productions were low budget productions or? Yeah, they're both uh, uh, you got pretty a lot low of funding. budget. I mean, from different uh, Well, I mean, Ulrika's Brain was mostly financed by the Canada Council for the Arts, which mm -hmm. is uh, an arts funding organization. And the Miss Andrus, we, we got some medium board money, we got some uh, Kickstarter money, and then cool. a few other sources. 
Um, but it's amazing because you know what you can do now with with cheaply. You know, because we shot in 4K, for example, so it just looks absolutely gorgeous. And and uh, you know, we shot for only 11 or 12 days, I think 11 days, um, but like 14, 16 hour days, you know, every day. And and uh, but the the you know also because we shot in 4K, you can like you can really. Um, punch in like 50% without losing any uh, resolution so it gives you a lot more latitude in, mm -hmm. in editing so um, it really I think looks like a it looks like a much uh, bigger budgeted film than it is definitely yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Um, I asked you about the budget because like I mean I thought like the narration is like mainly told in the Ulrika's brain by the voiceover there's mm -hmm. barely dialogue so how yes. did you come with this idea? I mean, I w did wonder if this was a result of like uh, funding, or it was like a more an aesthetic and artistic. In Ulrika's brain. Yes. Um, the well, you know, throughout the film, Ulrika's brain is communicating telepathically with Dr. Pfeiffer, um, <laughs> and that, a lot of that text comes directly from uh, from Ulrika Minoff. It's like uh, uh, it's part of the historical record, so we had access to that, and and. Um, uh, I don't know, it, it was a very improvisational uh, project. I mean, um, Susanna Zaxa, who's in both films, mm -hmm. she doesn't, she hates improvisation and she hates me when, <laughs> when I make her improvise, and, but she's so good at it, you know. Um, so she and Jonathan Johnson, who's uh, actually my jeweler, he makes all my jewelry, he, he plays uh, jonathanjohnson.com, throw in a little uh, 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 Milan, uh, Ivanka kind of product placement there. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, he, he plays Detlev, Detlev Schlesinger, the, uh, the, her arch rival, who has Michelle Kunin's mm -hmm. ashes, the neo-Nazi leader, gay neo-Nazi leader from the 80s who died of AIDS in 1989. So, um, yeah, they improvise a lot of the, the, the dialogue and then we use the actual texts from both, uh, you know, the neo-Nazis and from and from the extreme left terrorists. It's a it's quite a clash of cultures, like um, that, like the both old team, like left and right, meet on stage, and this was like quite funny. You have like a great sense of humor, like I mean, by this pro improvisation, anyways, of both of them. But I mean, do you put like or is like humor a way to put like? Uh, a difficult story in a different kind of costume that it's like more easy to make a film about it? I guess so, but I mean we've really gotten to the point of absurdity now in in the world and politics, you know, uh, you know, I mean obviously with Trump but, and um, so I, I think it, it, to put it uh, as a B-movie uh, mm -hmm. automatically gives it some humor, but it really is a B-movie, it's not I don't even have to push it into the B movie genre. I mean, life is a B movie right now, you know, with, with Trump. So sad enough, but yeah, sadly. So um, although you know, uh, it's good for for humor, and uh, <laughs> the, you know, there's a famous movie B movie called They Save Hitler's Brain, which yeah. I was referencing, and and um, yeah, I mean, I think it, also in these terms, you just have to um, you have to, to ha keep your sense of humor. Sometimes that's the only thing. That you have laughed really when you're fighting these absurd, you know, forces and reactionary forces. It's just you know, you have to laugh. <laughs> I would like to talk about um, the misunderstands now. I mean, you met like several movies in Berlin, or you shot like several movies in or around Berlin. So, what's the impact of this city on your artistic work? In terms of the Misandrist? Yeah, in terms yeah. of the Misandrist. I mean, it's like it's located the the convent where the federal, no, the female liberation army is like settled. So why did you put it in the outskirts of Berlin? Yeah, I've, I've shot like five or six movies now in Berlin, and I mean, I my two favorite cities in the world to shoot are Los Angeles and Berlin because well. they're they're my two favorite cities, and you. And they couldn't be more different, you know. LA is like the new world. It's so, it's bright sunshine. It's permanent, permanent uh, noon, you know, permanent, permanent uh, sunshine. And and Berlin's the opposite. It's like permanent <laughs> midnight. It's very gothic and dark, you know. So it's like I really like 
the contrast of the two. But in, in uh, Berlin, this time, you know, I shot in, on this location, this kind of a remote location, a mm -hmm. two-hour drive from from Berlin. That's where you know 95% of the film was shot, and shooting in this incredible old house that that. Um, my producers found it's like from the 14th century or something, 15th Whoa. century. Okay. And it's like, um, you know, it's a perfect kind of house for for this kind of genre of film, which is like the the, the kind of, um, it's also kind of referencing B-movies, like, you know, the Southern Gothic kind of uh, movies. It's referencing Clint Eastwood's the movie The Beguiled, mm -hmm. directed by... Don Siegel, which Sofia Coppola is now remaking, but this mine is kind of a loose remake of it as well. And um, yeah, so it, you know, it has these crazy trap doors and 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 really creepy basements and and huge attics with wind blowing through them. You know, so it's it's like a really good gothic horror setting. Uh, I mean, it's not a horror movie exactly, but uh, it does have a horror overtones for sure but you know it's just shooting in Germany in general I've been working with my producer Jürgen Burning here for so many years and I have the whole team that I work with you know over and again James Carmen again shot the Misandris who's shot a lot of almost all my films since Hustler White and um, yeah so um, it's just it feels like my home to make films in Berlin I see um, Susanna Sachse, you just like mentioned her, is the one of the actors like in both of the films. She's a kind of muse for you, definitely, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I first worked, worked with her in the Raspberry Rush, and mm -hmm. I was three weeks away from shooting, and I still didn't have the female lead of the movie. So I called my friend Vaginal Davis in a panic, mm -hmm. and I said, "Oh my God, I need this like, you know, it's just to be this." this crazy revolutionary, this, you know, terrorist, this really force of nature or whatever. And he, and he just said, oh, you have to ask Susanna Zaxa. So um, I, I'm, it was so low budget that I actually met her for the first time on set, like she, on the second day of you shooting. You didn't met her before? No. And um, she just so thoroughly understood the role and, and, and you know, and everything about the politics of, of the film, so she just nailed it, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, so I've worked with her four or five times, and I've worked since then, both in film and theater. And yeah, you know, it's like... It, I've seen you, some productions. Oh, good, theater, yeah, yeah, The Bad Breast and Jeep Lackey. The Lackey. one in uh, Herbe la Mouffe. Oh, uh, Pierre Rolineau, yeah. yeah, which I also made into a film, which actually won a special Teddy uh, jury prize. But. Um, yeah, she, she, you know, when you get the opportunity to find an actor like that, that really just gets you, um, y y you don't squander it, you know, it's like someone who just embodies your, your whole kind of philosophy of cinema, you know, um, the way she approaches her roles. And, you know, as, as someone who, who was uh, with the Berliner Theater Ensemble for, for years, and I mean, she's just a consummate professional. <laughs> That's interesting that she doesn't like improvisation. I mean, this mm -hmm. is like, I can't... I can't. Well, you know, she, the way she approaches things is really also like, she really hates this idea of method acting and like mm -hmm. this kind of emotional kind of acting. She, she really works from, from the, the, the hair and the clothing is where she starts, <laughs> you know. So. This is why she always <laughs> wears wigs in your She in does. Your <laughs> she wears quite a spectacular one in the Miss Andrus. She does, <laughs> definitely. Uh, uh, a white one, right? It's white with gray, gray. streaks in it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I thought the um, character of Isolde is like very, very interesting to me because she's like, I mean, in the end it's like, as a, a, sm a smaller society within the convent, so I mean, people get excluded. Like, for example, like refugees are get like uh, excluded in society. Yeah, ma or, like, marginalized. Yeah, marginalized. Uh, like yeah. Uh, queer people, for example. Yeah. So and she's like, to me, like a perfect example of this kind of power relation that she's like. I mean, every every character in this movie is like quite isolated. I think, but she's in specials. Can you explain mm -hmm. why she's so isolated? Well, I mean, 
I don't know if I want to give it away. Oh, okay. Is this going to be um, screen uh, aired before or after the, the screening? This is like when the film has been premiered. After it's been premiered. Well, I don't want to give too much away, but she is a she is a trans character, so mm -hmm. um, in the in the film and and. Uh, and played by a trans actor, and uh, who was acting amazing. Yeah, Kita, Kita Updeg. I mean, it was just a miracle that I found her because she just perfectly embodies the role. And I just found her on internet, uh, on social media. I just put out a, a casting call on social media, and um, and she just immediately. And it was you know colorblind casting as well. I knew I wanted to have a racially diverse mix of, mm -hmm. of girls, but I didn't know, really know which character, it didn't really matter to me which character was, was, uh, but, uh, was black or this, we have a Mexican girl, we have a girl of Asian extraction. And, and um, yeah, so she really just uh, was you know, a gift from goddess. <laughs> and it's really her first major you know, acting role and, and she's just such just, just a natural. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I don't want to spoil because I did this in the in a previous interview already. So I mean, good that you just like mentioned it. You don't want to give away too much like information price. Um, what I thought like was quite interesting as well that like everybody has a secret in this convent. Mm -hmm. So secrets are. It's all about secrets. Yeah. What is it like? I mean. So everybody, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's a team spirit in a, in a certain sense, but also like everybody does his own kind of mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and there's a certain kind of distrust under each other. Yeah, I mean, it, it's part of the genre really. Like I was also, the genre I was referencing was like the school, the school girl film, like uh, mm -hmm. something like, well, Bamboo, for example, uh, the film that uh, Ulrika Meinhof wrote uh, was an influence. And as I mentioned, The Beguiled is actually about a girl's school run by Geraldine Page, and they're hiding this Confederate soldier, Clint Eastwood, in, in the house. Uh, they're in, in the South. So, um, and that film is also all about secrets, and who's, no one knows who's sleeping with, with the soldier, and everyone's trying to have sex with him, and all the women. So, um, but, but you know, it's like schoolgirls, you know, schoolgirls, uh, uh, have they have secrets? They they kind of like um, there's a certain competitiveness between them. Uh, I mean, it's probably schoolboys too, you know. Um, they, probably. Yeah. You know, and uh, they're competitive, and they they're, they're uh, je there's jealousies, you know, and um, uh, it's just like something that happens in in a girls' school. I have like one more question for you. So you're quite fascinated about like German past. I mean, in several films of yours, also like in the Misandrist or, or in Uruk's brain, you face like the Red Army faction or like the Nazi, the Nazis. So mm -hmm. what's so fascinating about this like German past to you? I mean, you are from Canada. You mm -hmm. you were not born here. Definitely, you have a different perspective on it. Give it, give it, give this kind of view from the outside a more easy way to deal with this like mm -hmm. quite terrifying yeah, I mean, past? I don't know, uh, it's partly, yeah, as you said, as, as a kind of outsider with an with a objective eye, um, I feel like I can bring a different perspective to it. Canada and Germany, uh, to me, they, they share a certain um, kind of um, similarity in terms of being uh, like Canada is overshadowed by by the U.S. and so they have kind of an inferiority complex, mm -hmm. you know. And the Germans have kind of, because of history, because of you know the Third Reich and everything, they kind of really learned a lesson and had themselves kind of beaten down, had their egos beaten down. I think you know, um, and so, and you know, now very careful about preserving this kind of of, of this kind of strong. Socialist, left, social leftist kind of, um, you know, um, politics, and and not letting it happen again. What happened, you know, with fascism? So, uh, and Canada is a very liberal, uh, socially liberal country as well. So, there's some similarities there. But, you know, in in everything is so stark in Germany. Like the the starkness of the the fact that the extreme 
and the neo-Nazi leader in the 80s, Michel Pinot, was openly gay, you know. Uh, is it, just, and, and in fact, he thought that homosexuality was an integral part of, of his of this of, ideology. Of, yeah, the ideology. So that's fascinating to me. And then, of course, the Bader Meinhof were infinitely fascinating to me, especially when I was a punk in the 80s. There was a book called Hitler's Children. It was really the first book that was written about the RAF. And, and I was, you know, of course, they, they've been made, you know, glamorized and, and kind of like, uh, I could. You know, Raspberry Reich is a critique of radical chic, but but they they still had that kind of weird kind of glamour glamorous image, very very self consciously. You know, they understood the media and they understood how to make themselves into these kind of Bonnie and Clyde type, you know, romantic uh, uh, rebels. So that that always appealed to me. Uh, just that kind of strategy uh, style, I think, is always very important in, in, in any revolutionary movement and, uh, and they certainly knew how to work it. Bruce LaBruce, thank you so much for this interview My and pleasure. good luck for your screenings. Thank you.